One of you recently asked, I know your channel is about private pilot, but can you please explain oxygen and pressurization systems? I am very confused on them. This certainly isn't a commercial pilot channel, but you may still run into these as a private pilot or a passenger on a jet airplane. Let's start simple. As you go higher, the atmospheric pressure decreases. Higher altitude equals lower air pressure. Lower air pressure means there's not enough oxygen pressure in the lungs and there's a lower blood oxygen saturation as you go higher. The normal oxygen level is 95 to 100% and at 10,000 feet it is 90%, which from my googling requires emergency medical care. In the AIM, the FAA recommends oxygen use above 10,000 feet in the daytime or 5,000 feet at night. I always wondered why the lower recommendation at night and it turns out your rods in your eye are very susceptible to oxygen levels. And if you remember from my aeromedical factors video, we use rods to see at night. So not having oxygen is kind of a big deal at night. There's two ways we can solve the partial air pressure at altitude. We can either increase the amount of oxygen or increase the pressure. If you have an oxygen cylinder and a breathing tube, ta-da, that is an oxygen system. The simplest type of oxygen system is a continuous flow system. You open the oxygen cylinder and oxygen flows continuously. You use a cannula that you stick in your nose to breathe. Now that's pretty simple. The cannulas can be used up to 18,000 feet and above that you need an oxygen mask. Both the mask and the cannula can be thought of as the same thing except at higher altitudes you need a mask to seal the area around your face so oxygen can actually get into your lungs as opposed to just escape into the lower pressure from a cannula. Simple cannulas are wasteful because oxygen flows the entire time even when you're exhaling. So we have rebreathing cannulas and they reuse the leftover oxygen when you exhale for your next breath and that allows you to use less oxygen and be a little bit less wasteful. The next step up is a demand flow system. In this case, the oxygen only flows when you're inhaling and it's usually electronically controlled. It's more expensive, but it does save the oxygen and makes it last a lot longer. And then the most complicated top of the line system is called a diluter demand system with a quick dotting mask. It's used on airliners and it can be put on real quick. It's integrated with the communication system so you can talk and breathe oxygen at the same time. But you probably won't run into that. What you will see when you're using oxygen equipment is some sort of a flow gauge indicating that oxygen is flowing and you will also have a dial to set the altitude for the flow rate. And You can change that as you're climbing and descending. One thing you also want to keep an eye on is your oxygen saturation. You can get a pulse oximeter for relatively cheap these days and measure your oxygen level and if it gets too low use as much oxygen as you can and descend. So that was increasing the oxygen. We can also increase the pressure and that's the whole pressurization system thing. There's two terms we need to know. One of them is cabin altitude and that's the air pressure inside the cabin and outflow valves. These are valves usually at the aft or tail end of the aircraft and they control how much air leaves the cabin. So now the basics. We take a sealed structure and constantly pump air into it. We let that air escape at such a rate that it maintains a desired cabin altitude inside the cabin, usually below 8,000 feet. We don't want to change pressures too quickly for passenger comfort. We also want to circulate the air and dump the inside air to the outside to remove stale air and odors. And we also need to heat or cool the inside air to the desired temperature. Now I mentioned pressurizing to below 8,000 feet. Most commercial aircraft are pressurized between 6 and 8,000 feet at cruise altitudes. Why not pressurize them to sea level? That way you won't have any sort of ear discomfort or whatever. The problem with that is that the fuselage needs to withstand the differences in pressure between the inside and the outside. And the more the difference, the stronger the fuselage needs to be. At some point, it's not worth making a beefy airplane that can withstand all the pressures between sea level and high altitude, but it's too heavy to fly. So light and strong is the key. And the trade-off is that you have between 6 and 8,000 feet cabin altitude. 
One fun fact you might not know is that most pressurized airplanes are retired because of pressurization cycles. Each time you pressurize and depressurize a metal, there is material fatigue and eventually the plane needs to be inspected and fixed or retired. Fixing and continued maintenance is usually way too expensive and by then newer airplane models are cheaper to buy and operate. As far as I know, there are only a few single engine airplanes that are pressurized. And that's simply because you need a lot of airflow to maintain pressure and the systems you need reduce the engine performance to the point where it's just not worth having a pressurized airplane. Now as the plane gets larger, faster, flies higher, and has more engines, it's a lot more common to find pressurization systems. Most modern aircraft have an automatic pressurization system. Once you put in your flight plan and your top altitude, the computers figure out a good climb schedule and what to pressurize the cabin to. The computers control the outflow valves and they maintain a comfortable climb rate up to the cruising altitude and then back down in the descent. All pressurization systems have a manual override that the crew can use in case of malfunction and there are also overpressure and negative pressure valves in case the pressure gets too high on the inside or on the outside. So how does all of this actually work? There are air inlets where ambient air enters the system, then it's compressed and combined with hot high pressure bleed air from the engines or from the auxiliary power unit. The air conditioning system is a little bit complicated but it takes the air, it compresses it, which makes it hot, then it gets cooled, then the air is purified, dehumidified, and then heated or cooled to get pushed into the cabin at the desired temperature. And this is what pressurizes the cabin. On the ground, outflow valves are fully open and the air pressure from the air conditioning system inside equals that of the outside. After takeoff, the outflow valves begin closing and the cabin altitude slowly starts to climb. Once the airplane gets to cruise altitude, the cabin pressure is between 6 and 8,000 feet. The rate of climb of the airplane is independent of the rate of climb of the pressure inside the airplane. We want to keep the cabin climbing at a nice steady pace so the passengers aren't feeling all that earache. During the descent, the reverse happens. The outflow valves start opening a little more and the cabin pressure decreases to whatever the landing altitude is. Then at touchdown, the outflow valves fully open and we're back to equal pressure on the inside and on the outside. So now let's jump back to the oxygen systems. On pressurized aircraft, you typically don't need an oxygen system except in case of an emergency like a decompression or a malfunction with the pressurization system. Typically, the flight crew has their own dedicated oxygen cylinder and a quick dining mask at each cockpit station. The passengers have an oxygen generating unit above each row and that provides oxygen to the masks while the aircraft descends to a safe altitude. Hopefully that answered your question. I know it seems like oxygen and pressurizations are two of the same, but maybe this cleared it up a little bit. Thank you for the question, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning.